want to say thank you all for coming. Delighted, uh, delighted to have you here. I'm especially glad that uh, Don Manzullo could make it. He was stuck. He was on the I-95 parking lot and uh, uh, and was seriously delayed. And uh, but but he walked in just at the right time, just when we're we're ready to get rolling. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, you know, we're this is a this is an event meant to. Um, not let something die just because it's in the past. Okay, you know there's a there's a, we have a bad habit here. I, I know this isn't a problem for Koreans, but it is a bad habit for Americans. We get to, done with one thing and then we turn to the next thing and we just stop paying any attention. And free trade agreements don't naturally uh, produce obvious immediate results. That doesn't mean they're not the right thing to do. They're they're fundamentally reshaping structure. But it takes time for that to happen. And as Scott Miller, my, my colleague here, said, you know, you'd have, a, you'd have a hard time finding statistically the impact of the free trade agreement th this year. I understand that. But that's not the point. The point is that it's shaping fundamentally the trajectory of two economies as we work together going forward to, to both parties' benefit. And so this is really meant to be a chance for us to reflect more deeply on it. it. It's not history, it's the present, and it's, on, it's our future. And we're going to try to explore that a little bit today. Uh, we've, we have a couple of changes. Uh, Ambassador Choi uh, had a death in his family, and so he's not able to be with us today, but I'm very glad that, uh, that Economics Minister Kim is here with us, and we're delighted that uh, he could speak for the embassy. And as soon as I'll turn to Don Manzullo, and have him say a few words of, of introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the, our friends at Samsung Electronics America for giving us the opportunity to hold this today. And I think it's part of their spirit that they want to keep this debate active and vibrant. So thank you all for coming. Delighted you're here. Don, let me turn to you, and you can get this going for real. Thank you very much. Well. Uh, are we going to have a conference on uh, how much time we lose in America because of uh, the parking lot on 395? Uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. The, um, it's, uh, it's pretty, it really is a celebration whenever we talk about free trade agreements. Uh, the area that I represent in Illinois, uh, when I was first elected in 1992, uh, was confronted with the issue of NAFTA. And I had people coming to me and saying, you know, you can't vote for this, this is going to be terrible, et cetera, et cetera. And it was actually advised by somebody long gone in, in leadership who said, if you're going to vote for NAFTA, uh, vote yes, hold your nose, and don't go back to your district for three weeks. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's not leadership. The uh, purpose of a member of Congress is to go out and to actually make public policy. So we rented a... <laughs> Uh, not rented, uh, we went to the airport. There just happened to be a, a 737 available. I brought it into the hangar, and I brought out about 15 other vendors uh, who would be direct beneficiaries of NAFTA uh, for Rockford, Illinois. That was front page of the local newspaper in color, and that made people in the area that I represent start thinking about why I should vote for the, for the NAFTA free trade agreement, and it worked. It's a matter of making public policy, of showing people how practical these free trade agreements could be. And I voted for every single free trade agreement uh, thereafter. And, uh, but it was tough on course. Uh, former Ambassador Lee Tae Shek came out to my district. I picked him up at the airport, and we went by the massive Chrysler facility. And he didn't say that much, and then I turned to him and I said, Mr. Ambassador, I also want you to know that I raise beef cattle. And, um, and that was an interesting conversation as we discussed two minor issues uh, involving the United States and Korea, but eventually came together uh, on the issue of beef cattle. And, uh, and my animals are happy. They're gone now. Probably in for a hamburger several years ago. Uh, and also the, the automobile industry uh, here in the United States. But by the time a chorus came around, people began to realize uh, that there's something good about free trade agreements. In fact, it wasn't two years, uh, but a couple years before when the Australian free trade agreement passed in the United States. 
And people before who had never voted for a free trade agreement said, I think we should vote for the free trade agreement with Australia. And then Corus passed the House with a nearly two-thirds support, including votes from 59 Democrats, including uh, Leader Pelosi, uh, Steny Hoyer, and Sandy Levin. And then 45 Republicans and 38 Democratic senators voted for Corus. And so this overwhelming positive result was achieved after some mistakenly believed that a bipartisan consensus for free trade had evaporated. In fact, it was one rule that brought to the floor the free trade agreements for Panama, Colombia, and Corus. All three had separate votes, and all three passed that day. And so we can see what's going on in Congress as more and more members are beginning to realize the benefits of free trade, uh, free trade agreements. But we cannot rest in our laurels. Uh, to show that trade works, we need more than an aggregate statistics because they don't tell the whole story. We need to show how this agreement works at the subnational level and for small businesses. Uh, for example, my home state of Illinois has been one of the biggest beneficiaries of Chorus. According to the International Trade Administration, exports from Illinois to South Korea grew by 17 percent between 2011 and 2012, the highest growth rate out of the top state trading partners with South Korea. I would like to take credit for that, but I don't think that's possible. Um, some of the top selling goods include electronic products, chemicals, machinery, and food manufacturers, items needed by a mature economy such as Korea, and they were immediately liberalized under chorus. What we're seeing now is, is a real emphasis on increasing bilateral trade between the United States and South Korea. A lot of it has to do with the lowering of tariffs, but a lot of it has to do with the attitude of recognizing real markets are out there. And just three weeks ago, I brought together uh, several uh, people in the, in the Rockford, Illinois area, uh, along with people from, um, uh, from South Korea. Um, and they sat down and came up with some great ideas as to how to make this agreement work for the little guy who cannot have his own Washington representatives, who understands the absolute necessity of increasing his selling base. And so we're seeing really exciting opportunities now of small and medium-sized manufacturers, distributors, and producers in Korea and the United States being able to access more and more open markets. Folks, that's what free trade, is, or agree, what the free, what free trade agreements are. That's what happens when you try to say that before you've had enough coffee. <laughs> and so I, uh, uh, I welcome you here. Uh, this is a great celebration. I don't think we'll sing happy birthday, but, uh, but uh, it's just great to be here, and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, my name is Victor Cha. I'm a senior advisor and a Korea chair as well as a prof professor at Georgetown University. Um, and I, too, consider this a celebration. Um, this agreement was uh, uh, originally negotiated by the Bush administration when I was in government. And uh, we had two big agreements with Korea. One of them was the, the FTA. The other was the six-party joint statement. And uh, that one did not survive, but this one certainly did, and so it's a, it's a great reason to celebrate. Uh, my role here is um, to introduce uh, the Minister for Economic Affairs at the Embassy of the Republic of Korea, Minister Kim Gi-hwan. Uh, prior to his current position, he served as Director General for Multilateral Trade in the Ministry of Foreign <laughs> Affairs and Trade, dealing with WTO, APEC, OECD, and G20 trade matters. He was also involved in FTA matters as Deputy Director General of the FTA Policy Bureau and was the Chief Negotiator in the Korea-Japan FTA consultations. At MOFAT, Mr. Kim has served at various overseas posts, including the Embassy uh, in Muscat, Oman, and the Korean Mission in Geneva, Switzerland. He worked as uh, a counselor at the embassies in the United Kingdom and the Russian Federation and he also served as Director for Supporting North Korean Refugees at the Ministry of National Unification. He completed his military service as Lieutenant at the Judge Advocate General's Office and at the Fleet Command of the Korean Navy. 
He received his LLB from the College of Law at Seoul National University in Korea, which is the George, Georgetown of Korea, uh, and graduated from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom with an LLM and a diploma for international law. So, uh, Minister Kim, it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, this morning. We look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cha. I think it's Georgetown is uh, much known in Korea than Seoul National University uh, in Seoul. So, um, um, Congressman Manzullo, uh, Dr. Hamri, uh, Ambassador Stevens, uh, Ambassador Batia, uh, Mr. Cha, and Mr. Miller, and ladies and gentlemen. I, reg I regret that my ambassador uh, cannot, uh, cannot be here today uh, to welcome you as he intended. He asked me, uh, I convey uh, his uh, thanks, well wishes, and appreciation uh, to KEI and uh, CSIS for, for holding uh, this wonderful event to commemorate uh, the first anniversary of Chorus FTA. March 15th, uh, two days from today, uh, marked the first anniversary of implementation of Chorus FTA. During past year, uh, Korea and the U United States have put a priority uh, on the successful implementation uh, of Chorus FTA to help companies, workers, consumers in both countries reap the benefits of Chorus FTA. Last May, our trade ministers, uh, Ambassador uh, Ron Kirk and um, uh, Trade Minister Park Tae Ho, uh, conducted a joint committee meeting, uh, the highest level uh, meeting between the two countries to discuss implementation of Chorus FTA. Since then, uh, two countries, our two countries have held more than uh, 10 subcommittee uh, meetings with committees in trade and goods, uh, med medicine and uh, medical devices, agricultural trade, environment, fisheries, services and environment, as well as others. We are all uh, scheduled to have a Labor Affairs uh, Council next week, and in the coming weeks, we'll, we plan uh, other committee meetings covering uh, such issues, uh, uh, covering issues uh, such as financial and professional services, and Kaesong Industrial Complex, we call it OPZ, out, out, Outward Processing Zone. Uh, these subcommittee uh, meetings uh, serve as a medium uh, for uh, frank and fr fruitful uh, consultations about the issue of mu mutual concern and interest. They provide uh, uh, productive and uh, transparent channels and institutions to effectively address uh, FTA-related issues. Along with uh, holding these important uh, subcommittee meetings, our countries have also worked efficiently to manage and solve bilateral trade issues such as automobiles and pharmaceuticals. I believe a close conversation on these uh, uh, very difficult issues have led a real progress uh, these years, uh, these, uh, uh, these days. One year time is too brief to assess the impact, the whole impact and potential of Chorus FTA. However, uh, based on uh, successful imp implementation and encouraging uh, trade statistics, I would say that Chorus FTA has brought benefits, uh, much benefits to both the United States and Korea. This clearly looks win-win to both of us. In terms of FTA benefic beneficiary items uh, which enjoy tariff reduction or elimination, uh, it's not only tariff matters, it's uh, more than tariff, it uh, also deals with many uh, NTP uh, and uh, regulate, regulatory issues. So U.S. export, uh, in terms of uh, FTA uh, beneficiary items, uh, U.S. exports to Korea has increased by 2.2% in the first 10 months since the agreement took effect in uh, March last year. In the same uh, time period, uh, Korea has enjoyed an 8% increase uh, while uh, we are still in the midst of worldwide financial crisis, these are very positive gains. Uh, other than uh, uh, beneficiary items, uh, all uh, figures went down uh, show uh, negative. So this is a common uh, statistics uh, facing the world trade. But nevertheless, uh, trade, FTA boost trade for uh, beneficiary items. That is a, a symbol, great sign of success of FTA. 
Uh, considering uh, the potential in the uh, U.S. manufacturing and agricultural sectors, I believe that the uh, U.S. will enjoy increased uh, benefits over time. While the United States had, have, has had a trade deficit in goods with Korea in 2011, uh, it enjoyed trade surplus in services. These gains amount to $11 billion, have helped offset the deficit in goods. Taking this full picture in, into consideration, I'm confident that Corus FTA is a win-win agreement for both countries and beyond. Uh, furthermore, uh, since 2010, uh, total uh, Korean investment in the United States has overtaken U.S. investment into Korea. Currently, total uh, Korean investment into the United States amounted, amounts to 64 billion, while U.S. investment into Korea was 49 billion U.S. dollars. As you well know, uh, Coros FTA is the most comprehensive FTA with Korea, uh, FTA Korea has ever, ever completed in terms of coverage and the most ambitious in terms of scope and speed of liberalization. However, uh, my country does not feel that our work yet complete. Korea is actively pursuing expanded FTA network on both bilateral and plurilateral level. Korea uh, will begin uh, trilateral FTA negotiations with Japan and China. Korea has also begun uh, bilateral FTA negotiations with China and RCEP negotiations with ASEAN and its three partners, uh, six partners. I, I, while the uh, United States is engaged in uh, negotiating the TPP, Korea is uh, having separate negotiations of most of TPP members. Currently, uh, U.S. businesses have a great deal of interest in the TPP negotiations and remain curious about the prospect of Korea joining the TPP. We have, we have no doubt that TPP will be very much complementary to the East Asian economic integration process, which we are involved in, seriously. We believe Korea uh, could play a, a very important role in bridging uh, CJK trilateral, the RCEP, and TPP. In that context, Korea, a chorus FTA will uh, make a very important uh, building block within a larger uh, Asia-Pacific trade order. With that in mind, the new Korean government, a uh, uh, newly uh, inaugurated Park Geun-hye government, will closely examine the possibility of joining the TPP. Uh, in addition to uh, co commemorating one year anniversary of Corus FTA, this year also marks the 60th anniversary of Korea-US alliance. I'm very optimistic that thanks to the benefits of Corus FTA, our alliance will uh, continue to grow stronger and contribute peace and prosperity throughout the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today, and I look forward to exciting and informative panel discussion today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Abraham Kim, and I want to welcome you to our, the second half of our morning program, marking the one-year anniversary of course implementation. Uh, as you can notice, I am not Matt Goodman, <laughs> uh, CSIS Simon Chair of Political Economy. Uh, actually, I'm a younger and not as good-looking version of Matt. Uh, all joking aside, <clears throat> as we speak, Matt is doing his civic duty in a jury box in a crowded courtroom somewhere in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's with us uh, in spirit and wishing, us, wishing he's with us here today. 
but we are tremendously Sorry honored <clears throat> to be here today to mark the one year anniversary of the implementation of course FTA. In Korean culture, one year birthday is a very significant event. Uh, parents often throw a big party, what's known as dol, dol birthday party, where a lot of well-wishers and parents and, uh, and family members come together uh, celebrating this new life and a bright future for this child. We are here for the dol party for the Chorus FTA implementation, uh, marking the open of a new chapter in this U.S.-Korea alliance, as well as looking forward to a positive future. But as we all know, it took tremendous energy, uh, tears, and sweat, and hours of negotiation to bring about this monumental free trade agreement. And we wanted to bring together American representatives from both the public and the private sectors that were in the trenches to push this agreement forward, uh, to reflect on how Course FTA came about, its significance, its future, and perhaps sharing a few war stories along the way. Uh, I'd like to introduce our three panelists, and I trust that all of you have a detailed bio uh, in front of you, but I'll highlight a few things about our speakers today. Uh, first, I want to introduce Karan Bhatia. Currently, he's the Vice President and Senior Counsel of Global Government Affairs and Policy for General Electric. Prior to joining, to G, uh, prior to joining GE, he held many senior government positions, including most significantly to our discussion today, the role as Deputy uh, deputy uh, U.S. Trade Representative and the lead negotiator during the critical negotiation years of the course FTA until it was signed in June 2007. In addition, he led uh, a distinguished career in the Department of Transportation and the Department of Commerce. Uh, next is uh, Ambassador Kathy Stevens. Uh, currently, she's the Georgetown University's Institute of Study of Diplomacy Senior Department of State Associate. She most recently served as the Acting Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs and was the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea uh, from 2008 to 2011. And prior to becoming the U.S. Ambassador to Korea, she led a long distinguished career, including being the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs from 2005 to 2007. And then finally, Scott Miller, Currently, he's a senior advisor and holds the William Scholl Chair in International Business at CSIS. Uh, but from 1997 to 2012, he served as a Director of Global Trade Policy at Procter & Gamble. Mr. Miller had led many campaigns pro promoting U.S. free trade agreements and advising public and private sectors on international trade and investment policies. Uh, including being a liaison for the USTR Advisory Committee on Trade Policy and Negotiation and the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy. So welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, before I get started, I also had a note from our tech savvy communication crew that uh, this is also <coughs> being streamed. And for those of you in the virtual world, if you like to make comments or ask questions, uh, you can uh, use Twitter and use a hashtag uh, chorus anniversary. Uh, that's hashtag chorus anniversary to send in your questions for later on. Let's get started. <clears throat> uh, Karan, let's start with you. As the firm, former negotiator of the Chorus FTA, uh, please provide for us some context. Uh, please tell us how the U.S. Uh, Korea Free Trade Agreement came about and why, was, why did U.S. choose the South, South Korea as a partner to negotiate a uh, free trade agreement? Great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Abe. Thanks for uh, convening this, uh, this, this discussion today. Um, I mean, to step back just for a moment, uh, you were uh, in a period of time, this was sort of the mid-2000s, where the United States was pushing forward a very aggressive trade liberalization agenda uh, on a variety of different fronts. So you had uh, multilateral trade negotiations ongoing in the Doha round. Um, you had a number of bilateral uh, initiatives underway, mostly, uh, I would say, in Latin America and in, uh, to some extent, the Middle East as well. So we had pushed forward uh, FTAs with Peru, with Colombia, with Panama, um, and similarly Oman, Bahrain, and so forth. And those were moving along. And it was, um, 
uh, clear that those were important agreements, but they were not agreements that were with markets that had huge economic potential. Um, s Korea came onto the radar screen actually before I joined uh, USTR. Uh, by the time I joined, some of the preliminary discussions were already underway. But it had, uh, I think, had originally uh, sort of come up in conversations uh, with the previous U.S. Trade Representative, Bob Zellick. Mm -hmm. When I joined, uh, Rob Portman had just come on board as Trade Representative. Um, between him and uh, then uh, Trade Minister Hyun Jung Kim. And um, it was, I think from the United States, a very appealing candidate for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it was a great ally of the United States. There was clear political uh, connectivity there, uh, point one. Um, point two, uh, it was a, a country that was a much more substantial economic partner than the other ones. And I think there was a real appetite in the United States, certainly in the business community, but also I think in sort of government to see whether this model of a very uh, ambitious uh, bilateral FTA could be deployed in a big market or with a big trading partner like Korea. So there was a lot of interest in, in it from that perspective. Uh, and of course, having one with an Asian partner was of particular value as well to create sort of greater uh, geographical balance. But I think probably the most important thing, in all honesty, was we believed we could do it. We believed that Korea was in uh, a position and had a political commitment to doing the tough things that needed, would need to be done. And I think that probably more so than anything else was what ultimately moved us over the line. There's tremendous, you, you take a big risk every time you launch an FTA, regardless of who it's with, because so much gets caught up into that negotiation. Uh, and you put a lot of, not just effort and resources, but in fact sort of the credibility of the, the relationship into it. And so we approached that as long as well as other FTA negotiations very seriously. Um, but the feeling was that Korea, sort of in its own mind, was ready to undertake the kinds of reforms that were going to be needed, mm -hmm. and that the FTA was really going to be a vehicle uh, that more than anything else, I mean, certainly there'd be big bilateral benefits on both sides, but in some ways it was going to be a vehicle that would allow Korea and enable Korea to make those changes. And so that, I think, is at the end of the day probably the most uh, important thing. Very finally, I would just add, we had a president uh, when I was when I uh, was when we were launching President Bush, who just felt very passionately about free trade, he right. just was uniformly supportive of, of these kinds of initiatives. So I think that also, frankly, nudged us into the category of sort of saying, "Look, the boss, the boss is going to be supportive. <laughs> the boss is going to like this," and uh, and that got us in a good place as well. So it sounds like there was a tremendous <coughs> excitement within within the government about the possibilities and and the future of not only improving trade, but also uh, the future of this relationship, where it can go. Uh, how, about, how about the business sector? Uh, sure. Scott, you, you worked a lot during this period, uh, particularly as working for Procter & Gamble. <coughs> what was the uh, business sector's attitude? Sure. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, it's, it's interesting to reflect on the Korean tradition of, a, of the first, first birthday. I have two daughters. And uh, <laughs> I remember their first birthdays. I, my long-term memory is quite that bad yet. Uh, but uh, what I remember about them mostly is that they didn't have a clue what was going on. <laughs> and uh, when we served them cake, it got pretty messy. So <laughs> that's, I, that's sort of the situation we're in looking at, at this agreement uh, year after. But I, I make that point because well, for both my daughters, by the time they were 10, you could see what kind of people they were becoming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to start with a tenure perspective for a couple reasons. First, uh, because business looks in the long term. Okay, m commercial operations and, and, in, and entry into markets is done with a very long-term horizon. Uh, I worked for 34 years for Procter & Gamble. Our oldest operation in Asia was the Philippines, which was established in 1930. So the, there's, a, there's a very long time horizon. You're doing this, you're doing this for, for keeps. The second thing, businesses focus on the fundamentals. The one-year change in tariff rates is interesting. But more important are the underlying dynamics of the market. 
Uh, so, you know, P&G was in the Pampers business, still is in the Pampers business. So the number of babies actually matters a lot. It probably matters more than the tariff on Pampers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and uh, so there are, there are a lot of those, those fundamentals that are, that are part of decision making uh, that, now what, what role does a free trade agreement have? Free trade agreements are basically an indicator of econ economic reform. Free trade agreements change the trajectory of market openness and uh, and the rules uh, of operation. And they change it over time, but they change it usually in a very positive direction for business. So most of the interest with Korea came from the fact that it's a big trading partner, it's a big economy, it, it was, you know, had, had some very large shares of certain consumer products. Uh, but more importantly, it was a signal of economic reform. Now, I mentioned 10 years. 2003 is an interesting point to reflect <laughs> versus 2013. Because in 2003, uh, you, the U.S.-Korea trading relationship was about $60 billion in goods, uh, that's industrial goods and agriculture. The trade relationship was actually declining at that point mm -hmm. because that was the moment that uh, the China was rising mm -hmm. as a point of final assembly for a lot of products. So from a customs uh, classification standpoint, trade with China with the U.S. was rising, trade with the U.S. and Korea was, was declining mm -hmm. modestly. So there was, a, there, was a, there was some questions being raised, but also you know, despite that $60 billion trading relationship for the, for the U.S. companies who were doing business in Korea, the question really on, on business's mind was, is this really worth the effort? Okay? I mean, quite seriously, look, you know, there, there are some big markets, but, you know, the, the growth rates in the rest of South Asia were higher than Korea. So it didn't stand up well versus competition. It was a very difficult market to do business in. All right. There were a lot of foreign ownership restrictions. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, largest, second largest uh, insurance market in Asia, and yet foreign ownership of insurance companies was prohibited. Same in banking. There were also some problems with even uh, greenfield investments and being able to make investments in, in Korea. It was much more difficult than it needed to be, much less transparent. In addition, there were problems in that, a decade ago, problems with things like accounting standards. So if you were looking for a local partner, you weren't really sure what you were buying. But there were a whole lot of uncertainty that was part of that relationship. And given Korea's position versus the rest of East Asia, I think there were some marginal losses for Korea at that point in time, just because there was some suspicion that, is this deal worth it? Is, it, is this a country where we ought to invest versus you know, some of the other options at the time, like Vietnam? Bigger population, younger population, more rapid growth rates, uh, surprising openness given the, the, uh, uh, the overall you know, the sort of communist government. But, a lot of traders. So it was a very interesting dynamic. Now, the other thing that happened in 2003, and the reason I started there, is that is when Korea laid out the FDA roadmap. Okay? And this was the clearest signal to those of us in commerce in the region that Korea was serious about opening up to its markets, about reforming its internal market and, and getting the disciplines in place so you could eventually see your way clear to overcoming the tariff barriers, more importantly, the non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. So this was a very attractive market, remains a very attractive market, and the trading relationship, the fundamentals of why you want a trade agreement with Korea are still very good. The market access components, uh, look, the U.S. average MFN tariff is about 3.5%. Korea's average MFN tariff is about 17.5% or 17 when we uh, uh, when we uh, in, entered, when we started the negotiations, uh, so that that looked like a nice nice win for some very competitive American industries. Uh, there was good complementarity in terms of agriculture, uh, Korea being a net agriculture importer. But the the behind the border issues had a chance of being resolved in an FDA, and this was the really difficult part. Uh, Korea is the second largest cosmetics market, third largest cosmetics market in the world, U.S., Japan, Korea. Okay, read them and weep. Bigger than frauds. <laughs> okay, it's pretty amazing. Okay, it's a great place to be in the cosmetics business if you're a Korean company. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you are a, a foreign enterprise or operating on an import basis, it's a very difficult place to get a hold of what's a very large market, lar large by global standards. Mm -hmm. So a number of these behind the border issues looked like they were going to get resolved. So the business community was broadly supportive for those reasons. Big market, chance to turn around the trends, complementarity, and getting at the behind the border issues. Great. Uh, Kathy, you were ambassador uh, uh, during 2008 to 2011. Uh, you must have seen, in particular, the, the broader 
potential strategic significance of the CORUS FTA once it was implemented. Uh, how, how did you see the importance of the CORUS FTA from your perspective? Well, thank you, Abe, and thanks mm -hmm. to, to CSIS and, and, and KEI for bringing us together for sure. the, uh, the first birthday party. Um, as you say, we're, we're only one year into implementation of the agreement, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think we still uh, need to discuss and have to wait and see and also work to, to fully uh, realize the potential of this agreement. But I think it's not too, it's not too early to say mm -hmm. that uh, our ability to negotiate, uh, uh, ratify, and implement this agreement um, has taken already the U.S.-Korea relationship to a new level. I know it's a bit of a cliche, and uh, sometimes when we use it, we think, what do we mean? Mm -hmm. But I think it's clear that, um, uh, that the, uh, uh, so the, our ability to do this um, is a very special thing. It wasn't easy, and that's why actually I wanted to say a word about the process, mm. because uh, that's what I witnessed mm -hmm. not only in Korea from 2008 to 2011, but uh, watching Karen and his colleagues uh, on the Korean side work so hard uh, in the negotiation leading up to it. And one of the things that I think uh, uh, makes this, uh, this agreement so powerful in, if you like, a strategic sense in terms of the overall relationship is that uh, it was started, uh, the negotiations were started by uh, uh, differing parties, differing administrations uh, in, in, in both uh, capitals, mm -hmm. uh, with President Noam Hyun in power in, uh, in Korea, President Bush uh, here in the United States. Uh, we saw the negotiations completed under that administration. Uh, a, uh, a, a global financial crisis of historic dimension, I'm not going precisely in cri a chronological order here, change of power in Korea, change mm -hmm. of power in the United States, and, uh, and then a taking up of it again, and uh, finally a ratification implementation. Uh, I, I know that there were probably no doubters on this, ta uh, uh, on this <laughs> dais in the press <laughs> in this room, but uh, it was not hard to find people, both in Korea and the U.S., who said whether it was in 2008 or 2009 <coughs> or even 2010 uh, that uh, maybe uh, time had passed this by. But it hadn't, and I think that was a sign that people understood mm -hmm. that this had broad strategic importance in addition to its clear economic potential. Mm -hmm. And that indeed it was too, it might say, too important to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't. And the fact that it was uh, uh, ratified with such strong bipartisan support, uh, mm -hmm. uh, after fierce debate, uh, both in, at the politi uh, in political circles and, 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 and at the popular level, after that strong debate that it was ratified uh, uh, with a bipartisan agreement, I think underpins the point that uh, the U.S.-Korea relationship really is more resilient, enjoys broader support than ever, and, uh, and is underpinned by this, uh, by this FTA. Um, I, I just came back last night from uh, a week in uh, London, and uh, you know, if you tell people anywhere in the world, uh, uh, but if you go to Europe, that uh, you've spent some time in Korea, I mean, what's in the headlines today, as Victor suggested, well, it's North Korea. Mm -hmm. But do you know what I was asked about? Because the other thing is, mm, what about the possibilities of the uh, U.S.-EU free trade agreement? And the re why would they ask me that? Because of the Korea connection. Mm -hmm. I think the other strategic uh, uh, importance, if you like, of this agreement, even beyond its economic importance, is that it has positioned the U.S. and the Republic of Korea, and the Republic of Korea by virtue of its efforts on other free trade agreements as well, as the countries that even in very challenging political and economic times understands that we need to keep taking some risks. We need to keep moving forward, that mm -hmm. the status quo is not an option. Uh, and I think it, it, it's provided catalyst uh, uh, clearly in this country, and I think that's what we're seeing with both where have a TPP, uh, our the, the President, Ob uh, President Obama's initiative on TPP, and uh, uh, U.S. EU, uh, but also in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted uh, to ask all of you to take a broader perspective. Now that we're almost five years after the signing and one year after the implementation, uh, just looking back, were there any surprises of how the course FTA materialized and where we are today? Were there things that you just completely uh, didn't think you would go this direction, but it did, and you're pleasantly surprised or maybe uh, maybe a little bit concerned. Uh, is there, are there anything in, that sticks out in your mind? Or maybe some memories of, of, the, of this experience? Well, yep, uh, you. you know, it was two straight years of surprises. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was, I don't mean that, uh, I mean, uh, you enter into an FDA mm -hmm. and it's a learning process as you go through it. You, you just don't know what are going to become the big issues uh, along the way. I mean, you have some feeling for them. But, um, you, you know, issues emerge, some 
simply because they've always been there and rise to the surface, and some they're external uh, events that happen that came in and uh, you have to deal with them in the course of the negotiation. I mean, beef was uh, one that in some ways falls into both categories. We knew that, that, that uh, uh, issues around exports, U.S. exports of beef was going to be uh, very sensitive uh, and a very hard issue. Uh, and then along the way of the negotiation, there were a number of twists and turns in that uh, negotiation having to do with shipments of beef that were, were uh, found to be problematic and so forth. Um, and then you deal with them. I mean, they become crisis du jour and, and, and you try and make your way through them. I think um, on, the, on the U.S. side, to be honest with you, um, we didn't uh, anticipate that there necessarily there was going to be a change in the House of Representatives, uh, in control of the House of Representatives, and that that was going to yield relatively late in the process the requirement that there be a change on uh, labor and environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. And that required a renegotiation uh, or, or the, a codicil effectively added into uh, the agreement. Uh, so unquestionably, there were surprises through the entire thing. I think what I would say is um, two things. One, um, I, I, when, Wendy Cutler, who you, you were kind to refer to me as the lead negotiator, the person who deserves uh, the vast majority of the credit for the actual negotiation was was Wendy, who is the assistant USTR, uh, and and her team, uh, who did just a remarkable job working with uh, their counterparts in uh, MoFAD and Korea, who who were also a fabulous team. Um, but I used to say to Wendy, she would she'd come into my office and she's like, I, this one's, too, I don't know what we're going to do with this. I, you know, the, this one's <laughs> going to, the, the, the train is sort of teetering off the tracks. And I said, Wendy, this is going to happen. It's inevitable. Mm. This is inevitable. This deal is inevitable. And we joked to this point about, it's inevitable. It's <laughs> inevitable. But, um, but I think uh, there was just a sense with this negotiation that it's very much as Kathy said, it was too important to fail. Mm. And so you, you had surprises. You'd sort of figure your way through them. The Korean side had surprises. We had surprises. Mm -hmm. um, but you figured your way through them, point one. Point two was even regardless of how tough the negotiations got, mm -hmm. we maintained good dialogue. Uh, you know, I was on the phone with the trade minister, and, and Wendy was on the phone regularly, constantly with, uh, with then uh, person who became trade minister, Jay Kim. Um, and that, I think, is really what got us through all this. I mean, there was just sort of constant regular communication. And the embassies played an absolutely critical role. Uh, Kathy, Kathy's predecessor, uh, and on the, on the US side, uh, Ambassador uh, Lee, particularly in that time period, and, and his team. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't characterize as a surprise, but one thing I really learned, uh, and maybe this shows my, my, <laughs> my, my own uh, lack, of, uh, lack of understanding, but one thing I really learned through this process is that um, I think in both countries, in both uh, the Republic of Korea and the United States, um, our respective publics, and again, going beyond the capitals, going beyond the major sort of stakeholders, if you like, our respective publics are actually pretty sophisticated about trade. Um, I went to Korea, I confess, with a mindset having lived there in the 70s and the 80s, and, and the 80s is a pretty tough uh, uh, decade in a lot of ways uh, mm -hmm. in U.S.-Korean relations, but in trade relations as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember the, the 80s here when, uh, you know, uh, Americans were out in the heartland uh, uh, destroying uh, Toyota cars uh, in, as signs of frustration. I remember the aftermath of, of the 90s. So in both countries, I found, uh, first in the United States when uh, uh, as a part of a KEI-sponsored uh, uh, trips where I traveled with Ambassador Han Duk Su and my predecessor and successor have done similar things. We traveled throughout the United States. I think we're the only, two, uh, two, uh, we're the only countries that do this, that travel as two ambassadors. And we traveled around everywhere from Detroit to Montana to Kansas City and talk to groups uh, about uh, the overall relationship, but in particular about the free trade agreement and its, uh, its potential, its challenges. And uh, I was struck in every place that there wasn't a knee-jerk opposition. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of, we, we understand. Uh, we need trade to build our communities, to build our economies. How do we do that in the right way? And is Korea the right partner? And similarly in Korea. Uh, and again, I, you know, whether it was truly with farmers. I had some of the most extraordinary conversation, for example, with, uh, for example, with uh, 
uh, Korean farmers who, who grow those beautiful uh, pears, mm. you know, <laughs> uh, who were actually interested in the market in the United States for these pears. Mm. Not because the tariff was going to go down very much, and this is kind of Congressman Mazzullo's point, I think, uh, but that perhaps there'd be a new awareness of Korea, mm. and maybe they need to position themselves not as exporters of bulk commodities, but as exporters of something really, really special, and that the Korean-American community could help do it. Many, many examples like mm -hmm. that. But that was, I, I, said, I, I guess I wouldn't call it a surprise, mm -hmm. but it was something that I, I, I learned to keep in mind, that perhaps, uh, as is, uh, if I may say, sometimes uh, too often the case, uh, capitals are a little bit behind where their publics are, and I think this, this is what uh, made me optimistic, I'm an eternal optimist, but optimistic <laughs> that, that if we could, we could sort out some of the political challenges, we could, uh, we could make it through and optimistic about the future. I would say the other thing kind of illustrates that too, and maybe it was a little bit of a surprise, I recall uh, 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 in October 2011 when uh, then President Im Young Bak came to the United States for a state visit and was hosted for a dinner. Uh, sitting at the head table in, in, in the White House uh, following the uh, ratification in October uh, of the free trade agreement here was the president of the United Auto Workers. <laughs> what a good sign. What a good mm -hmm. sign. Mm -hmm. I think if I could just uh, raise, raise one thing uh, and, and understand that I was, uh, I was uh, six, feet, six feet ten and had a full head of hair when I started lobbying trade agreements on <laughs> Capitol Hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but uh, this one, uh, I think I would fault my, my friends and, and uh, associates in Washington uh, that this agreement didn't improve with age. We concluded it in 2007, maybe 2000, most of it in 2006, 2007, and we ratified it in 2011, and nobody got any benefits in that four years, mm -hmm. all right? And the world moved on. And if I could, uh, it's not a political criticism, or it's not a criticism of any party, because that's the reality of, of, of our politics. Uh, it, it passed with great ease, but there is a thing in the business world called opportunity cost. And uh, I, was, I was personally offended that we got lapped by Europe. We <laughs> concluded the agreement a after Europe, and they ratified right. it in advance of us. But that's somehow, the, we, we've got to find a way in the next time when there's one of these that is so beneficial to both parties to, uh, to not take our foot off the gas for quite so mm -hmm. long. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look forward now uh, from this point. Um, as uh, Mr. Manzullo mentioned, uh, referred to NAFTA, I wanted to bring NAFTA into this discussion. Uh, I think one of the lessons from NAFTA is that the political attacks against uh, FTAs do not end with the signing and ratification of an FTA. Uh, political perceptions and support can quickly change as we saw uh, in regards to NAFTA it be in the 2008 presidential election. Uh, NAFTA became a political football and a poster child for job losses. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise for pro-course FTA supporters now uh, to do uh, so that they don't go down the same path as NAFTA in terms of the public relations and the full implementation of this agreement. Sure. Well, if I could just, uh, one of the observations I made before we got started here is, I remember year one celebration of NAFTA. It wasn't a celebration. There was the peso crisis in Mexico, all right? And in fact, the critics of NAFTA, uh, Pat Buchanan, Pat Choate, Ralph Nader, the whole, the people who were opposed to NAFTA all the way along instantly blamed the peso crisis of 1995 um, on NAFTA with, with, with no real support for this fact. And in fact, if you look at the, the, the post hoc analysis in the, the, you know, five or six years later, what really caused the peso crisis was not related to NAFTA at all. But at the same time, it was a difficult time. And you right, NAFTA has become the great serving bowl of discontents for uh, globalization. Uh, I swear every time an Exxon station closes in Silver Spring, it's because of NAFTA. At <laughs> 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 the same time, I, I would recommend a couple things for the U.S.-Korea FTA supporters. One is uh, I, the, the dynamic uh, that Abe raised is, 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 is too prevalent, which is the critics are always critics of the FTA. The proponents of FTAs sell the benefits until Congress ratifies it and, it's signed and it enters into force, and then we do two things. One, we will we'll do three things. We move on to the next agreement. We count the money from the agreement we just banked, okay? And we continue to complain about the things that aren't right about the Korea FDA. Mm -hmm. Now, the third one is the one I'd like to change. I can't stop people from doing business. I can't stop people from moving on to the next agreement. But if every person who supported the, cor the chorus, who has some problems with the agreement, <laughs> 
who has some grumpiness about sanitary and phytosanitary standards, who has, has some concerns about you know, the, the, the cosmetics uh, regulatory working group, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. before you state your concern, spend 30 seconds telling whoever you're talking to about the benefits of the agreement. Start with, here's why this is good for America, here's why this is good for Koreans, for individuals. How it raised mm -hmm. living standards, mm -hmm. it eased trade, it, 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 it solidified relations with an ally. Then I got these things to talk to you about. As otherwise, we're in a position where we, the critics criticize and the proponents criticize. And it's like, I'd stop that. I'd mm. also stop talking about beef and autos because this isn't the, <laughs> this isn't the U.S. Korea beef and auto agreement. <laughs> it's the U.S. Korea free trade agreement. But that's just a that's a sideline. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, look, I couldn't agree more with what Scott says. We, I, I just think we have the tendency to win the battle on these trade agreements. You know, you 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 you, you fight to get them done. You fight to get them negotiated. Then you fight to get them through Congress, and then the coalition you know, disperses the, uh, the level of enthusiasm for even, even for the, not just for the agreement, but the focus on the relationship goes away. So I think we absolutely yeah. need to figure out how to do that better. I guess I would also just say um, two things with respect to the bilateral trade relationship. I do think NAFTA in some ways poses a, an interesting example in that you've had, you had this enormous development happen in the legal framework for trade between the two countries, right. and then really not much else happened has happened in that bilateral like, there's been a tremendous growth in trade and investment and all of those mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. but the agreement itself has not really remained evergreen it has not been mm -hmm. and i think now you see uh 20 plus years later with tpp and with canada and mexico coming right. back in a refocusing a thinking of how can we modernize this agreement it would be nice if that happened with our ftas more frequently than every 20 plus years mm -hmm. so i do think that is one the last thing that I would say, and this harkens back to something that Kathy was saying before, which is, you know, I think with this agreement, with, with Korea, the Chorus Agreement, <coughs> excuse me, the EU, the EU-Korea Agreement also did this, but particularly with Chorus, Korea really established, I think, its bona fides as being at that front cutting edge of, of, of trade liberalization globally. Um, I mean, if you look at the countries around the world that have actually been pushing forward and that Korea certainly is in the top handful. I'd love to see Korea continue to maintain that, that posture. I have no reason to think it's not going to. Mm -hmm. But you've got a lot of interesting trade negotiations going on in the region, TPP. Uh, you've got global initiatives around sectorals and so forth. It's just going to, you know, being at the forefront, being at, that, at the vanguard of trade liberalization requires constantly doubling down and constantly mm -hmm. remaining committed. And, um, we need to do that in the United States constantly. We do, and 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 I, 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 I it's wonderful to see Korea having been in that place. I hope it remains in that place going forward. Mm -hmm. If I could add one thing to just to build on Karan's comment, there's there's an interesting disconnect. Uh, commerce is organic. It always moves forward. It always is discovering new things. It discovers new markets. It builds new relationships. It happens all the time. Free trade agreements, on the other hand, are a, are a much different form of agreement. They are a treaty between two sovereigns. All right? yeah. They tend to be very formalistic. They're very fixed. Mm -hmm. And what happens, and Koran was absolutely right about NAFTA. NAFTA was sort of the, the U.S.-Canada-Mexico relationship in roughly 1990. Mm -hmm. preserved in amber like a fly caught there you know this right. is the way it was and what happened <laughs> is commerce moved on in fact the, the what, what excites me about TPP and the new and re, sort of it looks like we're renegotiating with existing free trade partners and we are because the way we do business has changed absolutely okay and in fact NAFTA was sold primarily if not completely on the notion of demand side on tr on selling things to each other it's about getting market access and selling things to each other. What we do in North America today, we sell things to each other, sure, but we actually make things together. If you look at how North America works and supply chains and the way components travel across borders, the average, the average X, X energy, the average Mexican-Canadian import to the United States has 50% U.S. content. The average Mexican import to the United States has 40% U.S. content. We make things together. Okay, and what we need are agreements that make things together. But it, but it is it's a, a disconnect that we've not figured out exactly how to solve. How do you put up this thing that the treaties that stand with you know agreements on friendship, commerce, and navigation, and, and you know stand in in law 
with the organic dynamic nature of commerce. Mm -hmm. Before I ask uh, Kathy to, to uh, say her comments, I just want to say that after uh, Kathy's comments, I'm going to open it up uh, the floor to questions and answer uh, for questions. So please prep your, prep your questions. Please. Well, I don't think I can improve on, yeah. on what's just been said. Uh, because I, I, I totally agree with it. And I mean, I, I, I like the image of a bicycle. It may not surprise some of you. Because uh, I, I think that the, the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, like the overall relationship, has to be seen as something that, ha that has momentum. You know, it's like a bicycle. It needs to keep moving forward. Otherwise, it falls down. And, um, and that is a particular challenge with a, this kind of agreement. That's a very interesting point that I think we do need to ponder. Mm -hmm. um, and I just also want to reinforce this point of making things together, making stuff together, is uh, particularly powerful. And it's, uh, I saw a number of examples of it, uh, discovered a number of examples of it uh, during my time in Korea. Uh, those, uh, all those Samsung TVs that use Corning uh, glass from uh, Corning, New sure. York. Uh, you know, the, those, uh, those batteries that go into GM cars uh, and so on and so on. Mm. I would hope that we would see, and I think we will, more and more of that, that the, and that the free trade agreement will, uh, will, will encourage that. Great. Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, give the audience an opportunity to ask the panel uh, some questions, uh, as well as the virtual world. Uh, but I wanted to turn to uh, David first. Uh, David, uh, who represents the agricultural sector and uh, wanted to give him a, a, a minute or so to talk about how Corps is doing on the agricultural side. David. Right there. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Abe. I'm Dave Salmonson with American Farm Bureau. And I can see that both congressmen and the panel have referenced beef a few times. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was certainly a large part of the discussion uh, back then. Uh, two parallel things, of course, were happening then. Both we had tariffs that had to be uh, negotiated uh, in Korea for U.S. beef, had a 40 percent tariff that was negotiated well. It's going to be decreasing and phased out over 15 years. But at the same time, we had the uh, countries that had uh, closed their markets to U.S. beef because of BSE back in uh, 2003. So you had a tariff barrier and a non-tariff barrier going on at the same time, and I think that uh, let us say it complicated the discussions a little bit, but it was all resolved, and uh, I think to, uh, to good result. I think what the chorus is doing for U.S. agriculture, and will do as the tariffs phase out, as was referenced, this is a longer period of time. This isn't happening overnight. Right. Korea is a very good market for U.S. agriculture, over $6 billion a year in U.S. ag exports. Um, we're our number one agriculture and food supplier uh, to Korea outside Korea, so uh, about a 30% market share of the food market in Korea comes from the U.S. But it's expanded the opportunities for a wide range of products. Uh, USDA has a Ag Outlook Forum every year, and they had one a few weeks ago, and one of the panels was talking about new markets, and when they talked about Korea, they talked about blueberries and dairy. Where were the, uh, I guess, wow. the number one uh, mozzarella supplier to Korea for pizzas, hmm. which are a, yeah. certainly a growing product, I guess, in the uh, Korean economy. So I view this as a longer term approach, but an expansion of market opportunities. We've been selling a lot of commodities to Korea. We will continue to do that for a broader range of fruit and veg products and processed food products. I think the, uh, we'll see how that works out, but there's certainly are good market opportunities there for U.S. agriculture. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll, uh, any questions? Let's see Chad back there. Oh. Check, hello. Um, yeah, we've got some questions from Twitter, including one from Don Southerton, a passionate career expert, global businessman, author, and strategist. Great. He <laughs> asks, we should ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he says he works closely with the car industry and wonders if you can share any data on how the FTA has impacted the US and Korea uh, auto industry. Thank you. Well, the numbers at this point are somewhat irrelevant because one of the things that happened in the last negotiations on automobiles is the phase out of tariffs and the phase uh, both in the United States and Korea were delayed. Okay, so th those will be late phase out. Certainly, the 25% truck tariff uh, still exists on U.S. Uh, for the U.S. on Korean-made made, uh, light trucks. 
and will exist for eight years, uh, eight years after entry into force. It's only in the ninth and tenth year that those phase out. The 2.5% the tariff on cars in the U.S. is still in place. The 8% tariff on Korean car, on, on U.S. cars into Korea is still in place. All right, so year one, it, it, may, it makes no sense to look at the auto trade um, uh, because, primarily because the, effect, the, the agreement has yet to actually affect terms of trade. Uh, in the auto business, so I, I would, would would caution that first. But Karan, well, I just add a couple. I mean, you have seen an increase in in foreign auto penetration, even in the period of time since the agreement was negotiated. But I I was having a very interesting conversation with Toyota, actually, and I learned that it, unbeknownst to me that Toyota is actually now exporting <laughs> vehicles from the United States to Korea, and yeah. is doing so quite successfully. So I, I, I just think it's an interesting example of, um, and, and to be honest with you, I think this goes more broadly than just the auto sector. And I, I think America, and I speak on behalf of uh, a major American manufacturer, that is still very much in the process of getting its head around what it means to be able to, to, to compete, what you need to do to compete globally and to compete in markets that you heretofore have not been uh, not been big in, and within our own company, we have a massive effort underway uh, to become a better global company, and that requires a tremendous amount of hard work. It requires changing the mindset of executives that heretofore have always thought about the domestic market and have been able to think about the dom the U.S. market because it's so big. But when you are trying to get growth the way we and and many American other American companies are. It's going to require you to go abroad. And even for our own company, in the past uh, seven, eight years, we've seen it's previously 60% of our revenues were derived in the United States, 40% globally. In the last seven, eight years, that number has flipped. Now 60% is global, 40% is in the United States. And that difference is only going to continue to grow. But the only way it's going to be able to grow is by truly being invested. And that means building products that are appropriate for the local markets. That means having a presence on the ground that's not right. simply just a sales guy. Right. It means having a deep-seated presence. It's the kind of things that we are doing actually in Korea to some uh, great success for our company. Mm -hmm. And we think other American companies are going to follow in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I don't have the uh, concrete statistics, but uh, 10 month statistic of trade uh, of auto to Korea, I mean US export to Korea, uh, shows uh, more than 90% increase. Mm -hmm. That means uh, uh, US auto is faring well. But you know, is, uh, we have a serious uh, auto, uh, US auto investment in Korea. We have GM Dell. So GM Dell fares very well. I think they, uh, their market share is uh, around uh, 10%, at more than 10% of Korean market share. Also, they export well around the region. Is it, so I think it's, it, uh, GM uh, Korea fares well. That's why uh, other automakers are not fare, that does not fare well. And, uh, but nevertheless, the uh, uh, core CFT shows uh, not more than 90% increase of US autos to Korea. That includes Toyota too. Thank you. And uh, the last time I had a rental car, it was a very fine made in USA product called the Hyundai Sonata. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we go to Richard back there. Richard. Hi, Richard Shin. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, first of all, in the Korea EU trade agreement, uh, after its implementation, uh, my understanding is that the Europeans have benefited more than the Koreans in terms of imports and exports. That is, Europeans are exporting more to Korea than Koreans are exporting more to, uh, relative to what Korea is exporting to Europe. I was wondering if anyone had looked at statistics for the uh, Coros uh, trade agreement and see if there was any kind of a pattern or a similar pattern or whether the U.S. is benefiting more relative to Korea. Um, second question is, you know, even with this Coros FTA in, in it, uh, being implemented, um, you know, for large companies, they're pre probably prepared, but there are a lot of small and medium-sized companies in both Korea and United States who really don't know what to do with this new agreement. 
And I was wondering whether there are government programs, both in the United States and Korea, that facilitate this type of trade uh, between the two countries among specialist small and medium-sized enterprises. It's a great question. In, in terms of uh, the post-entry into force data, this is, uh, I believe, 10-month data. Uh, the total U.S.-Korea trading volume is $80 billion. Uh, U.S. imports from Korea are $47 billion, up 1.2 percent. U.S. exports to Korea are $33.6 billion, down 8.1 percent. Now, there, there are two factors here. First, there's been consistent trade de bilateral trade deficit with Korea. I think it is probably washes out in, in the Asia trade deficit because what's happening is components are going to Korea uh, from the United States on to China for final assembly. It comes back to the United States as a product of China. So there's, there's a lot. Bilateral trade deficits is, I, I would just point out, I have, a, I have a permanent irreconcilable bilateral trade deficit with my barber. I buy a haircut from her every two weeks. She never buys anything from me. Okay, and yet somehow in our, in our individual macro economies, it, it all works out. Okay, so, so bilateral trade deficits are, are, first of all, 10 months, so it's less than a year's data. It's, it's also dangerous for a lot of other reasons, mostly how we count things these days. Uh, but the, uh, the Korea has maintained uh, a modest current account surplus in the bilateral relationship with the United States. Uh, as, uh, as the minister pointed out, that is goods only. If you add in services, it's a very balanced relationship. And the U.S. has grown in service uh, exports to uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, I think it does bear mentioning, I think the minister alluded to this, the difference between items that are beneficiaries of the tariff reductions thus right. far and items that are not. For items that are beneficiaries, you've seen the U.S. exports, uh, well, you've seen both sides' exports grow. U.S. exports grow to somewhere about 2.2 percent, right. and, uh, and, and for Korea, the number is about 8 percent. So, uh, but look, I would agree with Scott. I mean, we are so early on in this process, right? We are so early on. The kinds of big capital goods that, that tend to flow, that the U.S. tends to have as exports, have long lead times. I mean, we sell things that... You know, you're, you're, you're making the sale today, the good itself, and the, 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 the items don't flow potentially for 18 months, a year, two years, so forth. So, I, you know, we've got to give this a little bit of time before you start judging that. Well, and then maybe the, the other point about uh, uh, the, I guess, small and medium businesses who perhaps are, are, are less able or less uh, expert in, in taking advantage of the opportunities the FTA offers. Uh, I, I think that's something that, that both governments are quite mindful of. I, I'm mm -hmm. not directly involved myself, right. but I, I have observed that certainly our foreign commercial service and the U.S. commercial service here in the U.S. is very focused on, on in, in the respective countries, uh, uh, providing the kind of support and advice they can to small and medium businesses. I mean, the, the big companies really don't, don't need that. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I read in the Korean press, that's, that's very much mm -hmm. a feature of uh, particularly the new administration. Is that right, Minister? Sure. You need to turn on the mic. Korea and the United States agreed to establish a special committee on SMEs, uh, which means that we are going to, uh, both of us, I mean, USTR and US government and Korean government will uh, make a special effort to uh, support SME to uh, benefit more from FTAs. Normally, you know, they are not good at the uh, uh, how to uh, utilize FTA. So we, we the, our uh, ma aim, one of our aims is to increase the ut utilize, utilization rate uh, grow uh, among uh, SMEs. So uh, uh, during a very recent SME subcommittee meeting uh, uh, that took place in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, we agreed, both sides agreed to uh, make a survey uh, the impact, FTA impact on SMEs. I think is uh, ITA is a uh, undergoing some uh, study. I think based on that, we, we make uh, some very uh, substantial recommendation what to do. And at the same time, uh, Korea, uh, uh, Korean Embassy has launched some website, uh, koreausconnect.org. Uh, I think it's a very useful website. We uh, explored uh, six, four, uh, 64 uh, uh, US SME uh, success stories, uh, so which was uh, published uh, in hard form and also internet uh, uh, shape so you can uh, get an access US Korea uh, connect .org. I think this is a tremendous information resources thank you great thank you please if, if I could add to the 
to the impact on small and medium-sized businesses. If they are not taken care of, mm -hmm. this agreement is a failure. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that it, it's, it's a failure. I mean, if you think getting TPP through Congress is going to be easy, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're having small and medium-sized businesses that are beneficiaries of this agreement, I would suggest this. Uh, first of all, uh, COTRA, which is the, the Korean uh, economic development arm, uh, regularly is putting on matchmaking uh, conferences. I think there's one going on in Miami in, in a couple of weeks where they will line up 10 or 12 uh, small to medium-sized manufacturing companies. Uh, they will show the capabilities, uh, the milling, et cetera, and then they'll try to match up company to company. It's a little bit different mm -hmm. as opposed to product to product, but it may be easier because in the conference that we had in Rockford, Illinois, um, and the consensus there was that uh, the companies would be cataloged as what they can do in terms of capability. Because this is not intermediary, uh, inter intermediary uh, machining, it's working on a final product. And so COTRA is, is really involved with that. But, it, but one of the things that I would, I would throw out to you, uh, Karana is representing a large company, GE Aviation came into my district mm -hmm. uh, about three years ago and put on two fabulous supply chain mm -hmm. uh, shows. I mean, I, I actually managed the whole thing. I was there the entire period of time. Extraordinarily successful. Uh, we, we had uh, manufacturers that are uh, now ma uh, selling to GE Aviation that you know, never dreamed of Absolutely. in the past. And, yeah. and, and GE Aviation is not only expanding horizontally but vertically. Uh, one of the few companies in the world yeah. that's going in both directions at the same time because of the quality uh, they insist on in, in the aviation products. And I would, I would challenge the large corporations that really push this mm -hmm. to reach down into the supply chains. If they want to know how to do this, you just give me a call. Mm -hmm. you have, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. It's a supply chain conference where the little people get involved. And I know that's what Richard was talking about, about back there. And I chaired the Small Business Committee for six years. And so I know how to right. do that. No, 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 no. But I'd be willing to work with you on anything that you want to do uh, to help out the small and medium-sized guys. It's fantastic. F first of all, fabulous point, Congressman. I mean, and, and I think you all know, but there has been no bigger advocate for both trade and for the benefits to small and medium-sized enterprises than Congressman Manzullo has. I, I couldn't agree more. I, mean, I was going to add on to the point. Look, I think one of the great uh, virtues of, of uh, the many types of trade flows that are going to increase, certainly small and medium-sized enterprises on their own, but also small and medium-sized enterprises for whom the groundwork is going to be laid by large entities like a GE or a Boeing or a Caterpillar or whatever that, that'll go in there, both because we in some ways are the aggregators of small businesses, right? I mean, our... We have thousands of SME suppliers into our aircraft engines or our turbines or uh, uh, healthcare devices, uh, but also because that uh, opens an opportunity to create familiarity, to create connections, to create bridges through precisely the kinds of things that, Congressman, you're talking about. And, and we have done those kinds of conferences and, and will continue to do so. We have a final few minutes, but I wanted to uh, end with uh, this question to our panelists is, What's the way forward now in the po post-course uh, FTA era? Where does U.S.-Korea uh, economic relationship go from here? You talked about uh, commerce being very organic. And mm -hmm. I think we talked about it a little bit in our, in our discussion already. But where do we go from here? Okay. Let's start with you, Scott. Sure. Uh, well, look, uh, Korea is in a very uh, interesting position in that it is a member of has a free trade agreement with the United States. It is negotiating RCEP. It's a member of APEC. It has trade relations with basically all its key trading partners throughout East Asia. Uh, and uh, my own vision for this is that uh, you know, what, I, what I hope will happen, if you just look at East Asia and the, Asia, the consolidation and deepening of economic relationships in Asia Pacific, I think Korea is a key player in this whole process because what you want, what ultimately all the, all the economies of East Asia and the Pacific will want is interoperability between trade agreements. 
Okay, they'll have different market access rules and different di different commercial rules and different disciplines. But what you want is for border procedures and the measures that make supply chains work effectively. You want them to be able to operate in a in a in a seamless manner. So it's the same way if you've got old uh, documents done in uh, in uh, in uh, Windows uh, Windows 98, they still run on Windows 7. Okay, though they aren't identical programs, but but the they're, they're sufficiently interoperable. And I think that would be the goal, particularly on the, on, on the, the procedures in and around customs and uh, transport and communications near the port. Because that's really what makes supply chains work. Korea is well positioned. I think if they chose to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it would be very straightforward because of the similarities with Chorus. Uh, but even suspending that choice for, for the, the government to make on its own timetable, uh, the fact that it is negotiating with or has agreement with all these partners in East Asia, it can play a pivotal role in the further consolidation and economic integration in East Asia and the Pacific. Cora? Oh, um, oh. Well, oh. I, I think a lot of this has been said. I mean, I think we've identified, I mean, we've got to, one, make the chorus uh, uh, FTA work, and work for small and me medium businesses, work for both sides, work within the context of the broader relationship. And, and I think, uh, I mean, the, President Obama's been pretty clear about where he sees the U.S. going from here, right. both in terms of strengthening and broadening and deepening our strategic alliance with the Republic of Korea, and that emphatically includes uh, this uh, growing economic relationship, uh, but also uh, moving forward with the momentum and the lessons and the partnership that we've developed uh, by doing this agreement uh, to do others. Uh, and, and that's going to be clearly a, a very large priority for this administration in the coming couple of mm -hmm. years. Look, I would echo uh, what both Kathy and Scott have said. I guess um, it's interesting sitting in the vantage point that I now sit in. I, I uh, having been in government, the agreement's in place. It's a great agreement. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is going to yield success. Uh, I have no doubt about that. I think now, in some ways, the focus turns back to both uh, government policies in other spaces and uh, the responsibility of the corporate sector, of the business sector. And, and there I'd sort of say, I'd, I'd throw three ideas out. I think, first of all, we need to see a continued ongoing reform and opening process in Korea. You know, the FTA was a great step forward. It's moved the ball. But this is not a static thing. It's not that you're done. There needs to be continued momentum and progress. Uh, and I, I, I believe that's going to happen. Um, and I, I'm focused only on Korea at the moment. We need to do a lot in the United States to sure. continue to grow and strengthen right. our own economy as well. Um, point two, I would say, from a corp well, two and three are both sort of from a corporate perspective. I think um, you're seeing within the Korean uh, corporate community an increased focus on how to raise their own uh, innovative capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. a fabulously important thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Korean manufacturing is at, uh, at, 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 at has hit new highs. I think they're they're superb in that. I do think that we need more innovative capabilities there, much as we do in the United States. So I applaud the Korean focus on that. And then the third is, frankly, partnerships. Um, I think we're opening a new day uh, for for the idea of sort of. U.S. Korean business partnerships that in some way will mm -hmm. uh, mirror the kinds of bilateral governmental partnerships that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And so I would look for that uh, both with respect to the Korean market and with respect to third country markets. And I think the U.S. stands to gain and American companies stand to gain a lot from that and Korean companies do as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, Karan, Scott. Please help me thank our panelists today. Thank you very much.